Civil claims following inquest, tips, tricks, and licks on obtaining compensation for wrongful death and deaths in custody. Your clients have been through a traumatic inquest. You yourself may feel a little bruised. Perhaps you got a fantastic result. Perhaps you didn't. There's still the civil action to go. A loved one is dead and someone has to be accountable. And the way our system works, that's generally with monetary compensation. So how do you maximize the compensatory awards for your clients? There are many pitfalls. For instance, how do you decide who the right claimants are? Or for that matter, who the correct defendants are? With the right civil wrongs, all the while the limitation clock is running. Tick, tick, tick. It's a minefield. And at times it feels as if, one, not for the faint hearted, but do not fear, you're in the right place. Welcome to this Garden Court seminar by the Civil Liberties team. This is a fantastic event to sharpen your skills when dealing and pursuing civil litigation after an inquest hearing. This evening we have two speakers, Laura Profuma and Stephen Clark. I will introduce each speaker before they talk. Please um, feel free to put questions in the chat and we will get to those questions um, after both speakers have delivered their presentations. Laura will be the first to speak, and then Stephen. So let me introduce Laura. Laura Profumo, barrister at Garden Court Chambers. Laura specialises in civil liberties and human rights, with particular emphasis on claims against the police and public authorities. She does a lot of inquest work and um, related public law work. Laura has particular experience of advising and representing claimants in all types of claims against the police, including false imprisonment, assault, malicious prosecution, harassment, and claims under the Human Rights Act 1998. She's similarly adept at advising on civil damages claims against the prison service, Ministry of Justice, and the Home Office. Laura has a special interest in the creative scope of Article 3, and related investigative failures relating to circumvent the limitations of negligence liability. Uh, she recently co-authored an article on the subject in the Journal of Personal Injury Law. Uh, recently, Laura was instructed as junior counsel led by Stephen Simbler of Queen's Council to act on behalf of the survivors of the child sex abuse inquiry, the Nottinghamshire phase. It's my great pleasure to hand over to Laura this evening. Laura. Thank you, Leslie, for that introduction. Um, and, and good afternoon to everyone here. So I prepared a short PowerPoint uh, that I think our colleague Amy is just gonna get up on the screen and please anyone let us know if there are problems uh, viewing it. Right, so I'm going to talk to you uh, this afternoon about, well, post-inquest civil claims, give you a general overview of the type of claims that you can bring in this area following an inquest, some of the key case law and themes and issues to look out for, um, also how to go about trying to identify and develop potential civil claims early on in the inquest process, and some common issues and obstacles that are often raised by defendants uh, in these types of claims and how to best try and navigate them. So if we just move on to the first slide. Right, so here are the uh, general claims that you, one brings in this area. I'm going to talk in particular about uh, breaches of Article 2, 3 and 8 under the Human Rights Act and touch more briefly on the middle two on negligence under the Law Reform Act and dependency claims under the Fatal Accidents Act. I don't have a slide on psychiatric injury as secondary victim uh, as it's really a very narrow area in this type of uh, litigation, but I will also touch on that um, briefly. So moving on first to the next slide, which is Human Rights Act claims, Articles 2, 3 and 8. Um, firstly, of course, these can be brought on behalf of the estate under the Law Reform Act, but also by family members and victims in their own rights. Uh, an important uh, 
uh, first point is to scope out as early as you can who may well be a claimant in their own right. Um, so before the inquest, if of course your client comes to you um, at that early point, try and identify those indirect victims pursuant to section seven. It's a relatively expansive scope, so it can include siblings, parents, cousins, spouses. It may well be a defendant takes a point on that later down the line, but try and identify as early on who, in fact, are going to be those claimants in their own right as family members. Uh, another important thing to do early on, and we come onto this with the limitation issues, is depending on when your client comes to you, uh, it's very important to apply as soon as possible for the letters of administration if the deceased dies intestate. Um, and as good as time really as possible. If you leave it too late and you leave it after the inquest, you're running up against the limitation clock. It can leave things uh, very messy indeed. Uh, the other issues to get ahead of on the limitation front, again, depending on when your client comes to you, try if you can and lodge protectively for all your claimants that you've identified against all of the potential defendants that you've identified. And again, try and be as expansive as you can with the defendants uh, early on. It may well be as issues are narrowed out along the way, depending on the evidence in the inquest and the scope for settlement, that you can agree a drop hand settlement agreement with one of the defendants if it's actually clear uh, that claim doesn't have legs. But issue against all potential defendants you can at the beginning. And often you can leave it to themselves to argue between one another as to where liability stands or falls. Um, and equally on that front on limitation, try and agree to extend service for the claim form or just the particulars of claim if the defendants are being tricky about uh, just the claim form. If that's not possible, broker a limitation moratorium with the other side, again, all potential defendants at this point. Uh, on the whole, they're often quite reasonable about this, giving about a three month stay after the inquest. So that gives you time to properly assess the merits of the claim, depending on the evidence um, that has arisen in the inquest. Uh, again, if all of that fails, uh, then you're relying really on the court and the discretion of the court under Section 75B. Uh, and again, that's really whether it's in the interest of equity to disapply that one year limitation uh, limit. Again, there's some fairly unfavorable cases on this. A recent-ish case, I think from 2017, is AP against Thameside. Uh, there it's found there was no presumption in favor of a claimant who lacked capacity in relation to granting that extension. Uh, there had been there, it was found significant delay. Uh, the claimant did have representation for quite some time, several years before the claims were issued. There were various, I think, delays with the legal aid and granting legal aid. But again, that wasn't found as a sufficient reason. It was found that as early as two years before the claim was brought, when the report of the independent social work had been published that found the critical failings, that's when it should have been brought. And it wasn't in the interest of equity to extend the time limit there. So again, really try and issue protectively or agree that moratorium if and when you can. Uh, of course, it's another question about what what comes out in the inquest, uh, but council should be able to get a good feel of the merits even before the inquest process. Uh, but of course, that may change depending on disclosure, uh, depending on the findings, the outcome of the inquest and the expert evidence that comes after. If we move on then uh, to the next slide. OK, so this is Article 2 claims. Uh, the first thing to think about, and it will often already be well thrashed out in the inquest itself, is what type of claim is this? Is this type of claim that falls automatically uh, within essentially the Article 2 operational ambit? Uh, so that's cases which are within the prisoner state, administrative detention, and those also involved um, involving detained psychiatric patients under the Mental Health Act. That's where we can consider the operational duty to, in theory, prima facie apply, whether it does on the the facts is a question of whether there's that real and immediate risk engaged and the operational breach. Um, if it's not the case that you fall within those well-defined circumstances, and often, of course, in an inquest, uh, it will do inquest that the uh, family of representations at, then you have to look to the four features which are set out in Rabone helpfully and you can see on the screen there. Now, these are the four features that will apply in all cases. So if we're thinking about, for example, deaths in the community or deaths out with the confines of state detention, uh, those four factors as to whether the operational duties engaged are the existence of a real and immediate risk to the individual's life. Uh, so that in those cases is necessary, but not a sufficient condition. The assumption of responsibility for the state's welfare and safety. Again, that's the irrelevant assumption of responsibility in relation to the risk against which you're saying the state should have taken steps to mitigate. Uh, the vulnerability of the individual concerned. Again, that's vulnerable, re vulnerable, relevant 
forgive me, relevant vulnerability in relation to that risk. And the nature of the risk has to, of course, be an exceptional risk going beyond an ordinary risk that one can be expected to reasonably take. Uh, so that's the first uh, hurdle really to consider uh, what type of case does this fall under. And if we move on to the next slide. Right, so this just sets out the Osman test. It's a familiar test you'll all know. It's the standard really for operational breach. Um, and then we have here, and it's always important to remember this, is the defendant will often just rely on a very narrow construction of real and immediate risk, and they will have likely done throughout the course of that inquest. So real risk is one that's substantial or significant, i.e. not remote or fanciful. Uh, and again, in Rabone, that was a 5 to 20% risk of suicide. That was considered sufficiently real. Immediate risk is one that's present at continuing at the time of the alleged breach, rather than one will just arrive indefinitely at some point in the future. Um, and again, there's no need for that risk to be immediately apparent just before death. Uh, the case of Renaud de France, which uh, I've set out there, uh, was a case in which uh, we can see there it was held that the risk was sufficiently immediate where although the deceased condition and the immediacy of the risk of a fresh suicide attempt varied, that risk was real and the deceased required careful monitoring in the case of any sudden deterioration. And again, um, in that case, uh, I think in fact the deceased had attempted an act of self-harm about 14 days or so prior to the fatal act. There were no intervening acts of self-harm, uh, but his essentially vacillating condition in the meantime and that recent act of self-harm was considered sufficient to establish a real immediate risk. So there doesn't need to be an imminent uh, presentation of real and immediate risk or statement of intent on the day itself as, as often the defendant will rely on. It's worth also considering if we just uh, stay on this page for the moment um, in relation to whether the yours is a case that falls within the automatic operational duty or it falls within uh, essentially the fourfold criteria in Rabone, uh, there are many cases, uh, especially inquest cases, where they may well consider and concern uh, the death of a voluntary psychiatric patient. So in circumstances similar uh, to Rabone, it's often the case that the defendant may well argue in those circumstances that Rabone was a fact specific case, um, that the deceased in that case, although they were uh, non detained, they were a voluntary psychiatric patient, they were essentially a detained psychiatric patient uh, in form in substance, if not form, that if they left, essentially, she would have been re-detained under Section 5.2. Uh, Often the defendant will argue this case or your case isn't similar to that. They were a voluntary psychiatric patient. They were free to come and go as they will. Facts aren't similar to Rabone, so it's not an Article 2 operational uh, case. That duty is not essentially a priori engaged. But again, it's important to take the defendant always back to the fourfold criteria Rabone. Uh, it's not a question simply whether one is detained or not. Uh, there's four different considerations to apply there to the facts and evidence in issue. And another helpful case uh, in considering circumstance of voluntary psychiatric patients is the Strasbourg case of Fernandez de Oliveira against Portugal. And in that case, it was held by Strasbourg that the courts do, in principle, owe an operational duty of care to psychiatric patients who are voluntarily detained to prevent and protect against the risk of suicide. Now that's in particular relation to the specific vulnerability that psychiatric patients have, whether detained or non-detained, to that risk of suicide. So it doesn't necessarily extend to other forms of harm, such as death by way of accidental drug overdose, but that's an important authority if you have a defendant who's stubbornly relying on a bone, saying your facts don't fit the case um, and there's no operational duty owed. And just finally, in relation again uh, to that same case, it's Fernandes de Oliveira against Portugal. Uh, they set out there a very helpful fivefold criteria of where it might be considered that the state authority should have known of a real and immediate risk of suicide uh, to a psychiatric patient. And those fivefold criteria are whether they had a history of mental health problems, about the gravity of the mental health condition previous attempts to commit self-harm or suicide, uh, the presentation of suicidal thoughts or threats, and size, signs of physical or mental distress. So again, uh, those are helpful criteria to rely on. Now, if we could just go on to the next page, please. Uh, so causation. 
Again, it's a comparatively looser test uh, under the ECHR. It's not your strict but for threshold for causation that you have in your standard civil law liability. Uh, and then we could see that for an article two violation to be established, it has to be essentially matters which had a real prospect or a substantial chance of altering the outcome. And that's from Savage Door, measures which judge reasonably might have been expected to avoid that risk. Again, so that's a looser test and that's helpful, especially for drawing out in the course of the inquest. And that's why it's incredibly important to start essentially considering the merits of your claim as early as you can, so you can start strategizing during the inquest itself and deploy any, for example, expert evidence from your inquest in relation to causation and also causative critical findings that a jury may well come back with. Uh, it's often good to try and mobilize those early in the course of settlement and try and capitalize or, or on an early agreement and settlement. So again, uh, that's another favorable point uh, to use in these proceedings. Moving then on uh, to quantum under the Human Rights Act, which is on the next page. So, uh, Non-pecuniary damages for Article 2 claims on behalf of the estate and, of course, also on behalf of uh, family uh, members in their own right, they're generally modest, um, but there is still a considerable range. Um, roughly, I would say a range of around £10,000 to £20,000 is usually the range that one might go for. But of course, you can have awards which are much higher, depending on the particular facts of the case. And you can use and look to the Strasbourg case law, which is fairly broad to, to tailor to your particular facts. And again, following on from that, uh, the case law in this area from Strasbourg, it, it adopts a fairly flexible, uh, broad brush approach to quantification in this area. So it looks at the overall nature, the extent and the severity of the relevant breaches. There's also some quite helpful uh, ratio in the case of DSD in the High Court. This is uh, Justice Green's uh, quantum judgment. He talks there about the general principles, both for approaching the quantification of uh, both non-pecuniary and pecuniary damages under the Human Rights Act. It makes clear again uh, that it's a broad uh, approach, that they will look essentially to the general principles of equity. There's no need, for example, to have medical evidence uh, or specific causative evidence. It may well be from the finding of uh, Article 2 or Article 3 violation, uh, it's found that an individual just suffered a level of generalized anxiety or distress, even if they don't have um, evidence of that. Of course, evidence does help enhance the quantum, uh, but it's a much more broad brush approach. It's not looking to the but for causation or any type of counterfactual analysis to quantify. Again, damages will vary between uh, the uh, awards for the estate and the family victims, but it may well be, of course, that you're settling on a global basis, but that will implicitly uh, be guided by the relevant awards for each. Uh, so 10 grand to 20 grand, that's your broad figure, uh, but of course there can be variation. Um, some of those cases that I've got down there, Anguilla over against Bulgaria. So that was an Article 2 uh, case of substantive breach where uh, the deceased died in custody. It was found the state failed to advance a plausible explanation for the injuries the deceased uh, died from. And also they culpably delayed in calling the ambulance in time. And it was on that basis that an award of around 15,000 euros uh, was given to the estate. Again, one always has to remember to, to change and adjust this for exchange rate and inflation. Uh, and the mother also had a more modest reward of around uh, four euro, 4 thousand euros uh, for the suffering bereavement that she suffered as a result. Uh, the next case we have there is Edwards against the UK. Uh, that was a global award of £20,000. There was no apportionment there specifically between the estate and the family victims. And that was again uh, for Article 2 operational failings uh, in relation to a, a deceased who died in prison who was killed by their cellmate. And it was also found that there was an additional level of distress and frustration suffered by the parents in their inability to secure, to secure address uh, from the state, because there were various, I think, protracted failings from the prison and the investigative uh, inquiry that followed that. In relation to damages for uh, family members, 
Uh, again, you look to a bone for factors that will tend to place you towards the higher end of the bracket or the lower, it depend on the proximity and relationship between uh, the individuals and also whether the authorities acted in a particularly distressing way that compounded the breach. Now, I'm going to move on now to the next slide, as I think my colleague Stephen will be picking up this and talking to you a bit more about quantum. Now, Article 3 and Article 8, uh, you have to think really early on again whether a claim under either of these heads is going to add anything to an Article 2 operational claim or systemic breach claim. And it may, may well be that there are cases uh, where they do add and enhance. Uh, for example, in a case of a mentally vulnerable prisoner, uh, who commits suicide. If you're struggling with Article 2 substantive violation, it's tricky to get off the ground for the real and immediate. Uh, you could still find an alternative route to liability under Article 3, uh, where there are particular failings or deficits in the deceased clinical care, or if they're particularly vulnerable um, and suffer from particular mental health conditions, uh, that in itself may well amount, or the conditions of the detention may amount to an Article 3 violation. Uh, the case there, it's in fact Keenan, I don't know why I've written Kenan, apologies for that. Um, but that was a case that where well, there was no Article 2 violation. It was found, in fact, the prison did take uh, sufficient steps uh, to monitor and guard against any real and immediate risk posed to deceased. And it was accepted he did pose throughout an intimate risk of suicide. He suffered from quite severe psychosis and previous self-harm and suicidal attempts. Uh, but it was found that there was an Article 3 breach uh, as there were significant failings in the psychiatric care he received. Uh, there was ineffective monitoring of uh, his particular mental health vulnerability, and he was also placed in segregation in the period leading up to his death. So, so it was the cumulative circumstances there that led to an Article 3 uh, breach. There's another case that's not down here, but it's McGlinchey against the UK. It's a 2003 Stratford case. And in that case, the deceased died in prison as a result of suffering quite severe uh, heroin withdrawal symptoms. And in the week or so prior to her death, she suffered from very severe dehydration, lack of appetite and vomiting. Uh, it wasn't found to be effectively monitored or assessed uh, by the healthcare. And it was the various clinical failings uh, and failings in the manage management and monitoring of the deceased withdrawal symptoms uh, that established the Article 3 breach there, again, uh, in the absence of an Article 2. Uh, Article 3 threshold, of course, it has to meet a minimum level of severity for mistreatment. That, again, is contextual. It depends on all the relevant factors there, the nature and the context of the treatment, the duration, the physical and mental effects, but also the specific vulnerabilities, the age and the sex of the victim. Uh, so, again, it's always worth considering first, uh, is this treatment that's going to meet that threshold in the first place? And um, Article 8 claims, again, it's worth considering, and they may well not be, they may not add anything uh, to, for example, procedural breaches under Article 2 or 3, but is there anything in particular the handling of either the inquest or the civil claim or the post-death investigation that may lead uh, to a standalone claim for the family uh, under Article 8? So those are all elements to consider uh, under 3 and 8, but you don't simply tack it on uh, to add to it. They have to, in themselves, bring something to the litigation. So moving on uh, to the next Claim. Now, this is claims by the estate under the law reform act. So this is it does what it says on the tin there. It provides for the survival of causes of actions for the deceased personal estate, which the injured person would have had on their death. So negligence is really the primary uh, and the obvious one here. You could also have assault or any type of tortious claim like that. It, it enables the estate to recover for loss and damage sustained by the deceased. So this is a route into you getting uh, PSLA damages. Uh, and in doing so, first of all, it's obvious, but you need to satisfy the criteria for negligence. Um, so you need to meet the relevant criteria there and also the but for causation. If you haven't done that, you're not going to get past this. And of course, secondly, you need to establish essentially that the individual did suffer pain, suffering and loss and immunity. You need to uh, consider the medical evidence that you have available. It's also important to consider here uh, the period of pre-death suffering. So the period, for instance, in, in a particular inquest that an individual was vulnerable in detention for before the fatal act itself. The longer the period, uh, the greater the likely award for PSLA. Uh, and although it may sound perverse, this will mean that 
PSLA will be greater in a self-inflicted death in custody, uh, where the deceased has had a period of consciousness in hospital, let's say several days or weeks before they die, than, for example, a case of police shooting, uh, where that death is near instantaneous uh, after seeing essentially the trigger be pulled. Uh, so it's that period of pre-death suffering which is relevant here on behalf of the deceased estate. Uh, you can also here consider special damages, so lof, loss of earnings in that pre-death period, medical, ex, medical expenses, uh, funeral expenses, uh, but importantly under section one, two, it does preclude recovery of damages for exemplary uh, damages and also projected loss of income. And that's again, preventing the, the double dip essentially that you recover under this and the fatal accidents at route two. Um, so recover under the latter and not, not under this route. Again, they're uh, just emphasizing it's more stringent but for causation test here. So it may well be that you have facts which lend to a very strong Article 2 claim, but they just can't get um, or pass muster or on the but for causation test here. You also need to consider the risk of contributory negligence, that you get a reduction for that. Uh, that can theoretically apply in cases of self inflicted deaths. In the case of Reeves, for instance, there was a reduction of 50% where the deceased was of sound mind when they took their own life. So that's another factor to consider uh, within this route. Moving on to the next slide. And this is dependency damages uh, under the Fatal Accidents Act. So, so again, uh, this confers the right of action for any wrongful act, neglect or default, which if death hadn't occurred, would have entitled the injured per party to bring the action and recover the damages against the person who would have been liable if death hadn't occurred. So once more, you've got to make sure you can establish that cause of action, the underlying cause of action. Uh, most often cases, it's negligence. And equally, the same uh, considerations for reduction of contributing ne negligence also apply here, I think, under Section 5 of this Act. Um, now, the definition for dependence here, it's, again, pretty expansive. You've got parents, siblings, aunts, uh, former wife, civil partner. It's important as early as you can on equally to identify those dependents and likewise to identify the claim for pecuniary benefit that will apply. Uh, that's set out in section 3.1. So it's proportioned to the injury, injury resulting from the death to the dependents respectively. Uh, so it's any reasonable expectation of pecuniary benefit which arose as a result of the family relationship and which would have continued um, if death hadn't occurred. And if we move on to the next slide. Yeah, so we have here the claim for future earnings on which the dependent would have relied. Uh, you need to, of course, substantiate this with your proper evidence and workings. It will no likely be picked uh, apart by the defendant. The standard of proof here for expected uh, entitlement or pecuniary benefit is lower than your balance of probabilities is whether there was a significant chance, so a greater than speculative possibility of such pecuniary entitlement continuing if the individual hadn't died. It can extend to gratuitous or intangible services there, so the loss to a child of a parent's care or support or the loss of the services um, or support of a spouse. And you can also see there under section 1A2, uh, one can also recoup for bereavement damages under this particular head, um, and that is uh, recently held applied to cohabitees, as well as uh, parents of a minor spouse or a civil partner as well. Uh, now, it's also important, again, to consider that if you can't, for whatever reason, recover dependency damages under this route, how else are you going to do it? It may well be that you can recover pecuniary damages uh, under your Human Rights Act claim. Um, and again, you'd have to satisfy the court that that was necessary to afford just satisfaction to the victims. But they are more than recoverable under that head um, if you can establish uh, the basis for it. Before I move on to the next slide, what I haven't included anywhere here is psychiatric injury. Um, uh, recovery as a secondary victim, again, is the restrictive Alcott criteria that apply uh, for secondary victims. So those are victims who were not directly involved or, or threatened in the shocking situation, but they're close family members of those who were injured or killed. Uh, the restrictive criteria is whether in order to qualify as a secondary victim is whether there's a relationship of love and affection with the primary victim, uh, whether the secondary victim has come across the immediate aftermath of the event, uh, the direct perception of harm to the primary victim and that the secondary victim is of reasonable fortitude. These are in practice 
pretty difficult to bring. Um, I haven't yet brought one. Uh, it may well be um, my colleagues can help a bit more on this, but, but it's worth tacking in and always considering when you look at all the expansive possibilities here for litigating. If we move on to the next slide, and this is uh, defendant issues. So how to navigate some of the issues that often uh, crop up here. Now, the first one, it's just reliance on the evidence and outcome of the inquest. This goes both ways. Of course, the claimants will also will rely on that too. Uh, but it's worth also just outlining, you know, it's a different threshold entirely. The different issues in scope is an entirely different arena. They're not determined for the civil merits of a claim, but they will uh, inform defendants' appetite for settlement and settling early. And also how brave they feel in taking uh, the claim further. Uh, another uh, common issue, and again, this is just from my experience, uh, many, many other practitioners ha may have different experiences, uh, but the restrictive interpretation of the threshold of Article 2 operational breach. Um, so again, you see this often uh, by the institutional IPs and inquests, the deceased didn't expressly evince or present or verbalize suicidal ideation in the period immediately prior to death, but again, present and continuous continuing risk. It doesn't require that. Renault and France and so on, it's worth setting out the case law that we've already looked at. Again, uh, we've already touched on this, but cases of deaths of voluntary psychiatric patients, defendants will often try and uh, distinguish Rabone to your current circumstances. They'll say that was a case where there was a um, detained per patient who was in su substance of detained patient, if not in fact form. There was clear evidence they would have been re-detained if they tried to leave. That was not the case um, on the facts of, of the present case. And, and again, it's worth just uh, directing them to the fourfold criteria in Rabone if that's relied on. But there's also a well, a relatively uh, recent Court of Appeal case of Moraham, uh, useful in this context, less so actually in the engagement of uh, the investigative duty in inquest. Um, but that was a case which considers specifically the risk uh, to a voluntary psychiatric patient of, of accidental drug overdose. Um, but, but in doing so, it was made clear, uh, and I'm just going to uh, reference the particular, it's paragraph 65 to 67 of the Moraghan judgment, um, that whether or not that operational duty is engaged in cases of voluntary psychiatric patients is not just by reference to the relationship that the individual has to state, so whether they're detained under section three, whether they're a voluntary psychiatric patient, but more crucially to the type of harm of which the individual is foreseeably at real and immediate risk. So in cases where vulnerable people are cared for by an institution which exercise some control over them, the question whether an operational duty is owed to protect them from a foreseeable risk of a particular type of harm is informed by whether the nature of the control is linked to the type of harm. So essentially there has to be a specific link between the care and control that the hospital is exercising in relation to that individual and the specific harm um, which they are at risk. So if an individual is at risk of suicide and that is allied and linked to their mental health condition, uh, that in itself will be strong grounds for saying the article duty is engaged. So we're moving away from the restricted rabbit interpretation. It's whether or not they are in fact um, or, or could be capable of being redetained. And I've just been uh, rightly, um, I, I think, pointed out that that's a high court judgment. I think I put court of appeal uh, case there. Um, thank you for that. Um, so again, it's important to push back on, on any attempts to, to focus solely on some of the Rabone uh, dicta. If we can just move on to the next slide. And this is another bugbear that comes up a, a fair amount. Um, and it's again, defendants seeking to rely on the line of all authority, which is Powell, but also Lupa D'Souza, um, which concern, well, alleged op operational uh, failings in the context of ordinary hospital negligence and applying that to the context of state detention. Uh, and it's important to make clear that there are different considerations apply. In cases, uh, for example, of hospital failings, which are individualized failings in an ordinary hospital context, uh, one either needs to establish a systemic breach or, as per Lope de Souza, a denial of access to life-saving treatment, so exceptional circumstances that engage that operational duty. But those considerations don't apply to what I'm going to call medical deaths in custody, so cases where there are alleged clinical failings um, in the context of, of a deceased death in custody. That's made clear in Lope de Souza itself, but it's also made clear in Tyrrell and Daniel in St George's. Uh, Tyrrell was a case, again, where it was a death by natural 
causes. Uh, but in the ratio itself, it's a paragraph 33, it made, it's made clear that the Osman test will still apply in relation to an allegation of a failure to apply uh, timely and appropriate medical care to a detainee. Uh, so it's still Article 2 operational duty remit, um, if that's the allegation. And also the case of Maguire, again, also finds that the operational duty still bites in relation to medical deaths in custody. You can't rely on your pal and Lupita Caesar line of authority. Uh, and again, uh, the relevant quote is there. Uh, and what's made clear and looking at all these authorities in total is when you're considering about medical failings in custody, you consider it on the Osman threshold, but if it's a question of individualized or operational failings from external healthcare providers, so hospital care and so on, then you have to revert your systemic breach or look at a SUSE uh, line of authority. So, so those are essentially the, the differences between the two. Um, now, there are lots more, I think, if we just move on to the final slide. There are lots more issues here, and my uh, colleague uh, Stephen is particularly going to uh, touch on dependency claims and how to make your schedule of loss tight because the defendant will no doubt try and pick holes in them about an individual's employment prospects and so on, their life expectancy depending on, on their past history and circumstance at the time of their death. Um, likewise, it is quite common for defendants to seek to resist attempts to recover for pecuniary damage under the Human Rights Act. Uh, again, Green's guidance in DSD is really helpful on this, you can more than recover under that uh, remit if it's necessary for just satisfaction. Uh, and again, equally attempt to challenge the victim status uh, for family members. Uh, this is often normally relied on early on uh, and may fall away. There may be a need, for example, uh, to prove parentage and so on, uh, but often it's not a substantial stumbling block. Um, so just drawing this all together, uh, really, it, it's key to try uh, and capitalise, of course, on, on the opportunities and the evidence that you have and is drawn out in the inquest uh, to enter into settlement early, uh, but also uh, to try and get a feel really uh, for the defendant in the scope of negotiations. Very few of these type of cases are actually litigated and defendants will be able uh, to identify cases that they know simply can't go to court uh, and do require settlement as soon as possible. They will be alive to those risks and they'll be alive to the evidence at the inquest. Uh, but I hope this has been somewhat helpful, providing some top ticks and tactics. And I'm now going to hand back over to Leslie, who will pass you on to my colleague, Stephen. Thank well, you. thank you, um, Laura. That was really informative. Uh, and I know that, you know, for me, I got, you know, quite a few tips from that. Now, um, I'm going to now introduce Stephen Clark, um, another member of the Civil Liberties team at Garden Court Chambers. Stephen specialises in complex multidisciplinary work which draws on the full range of his flourishing practice and with recent successes in the Supreme Court, Court of Appeal and the European Court of Human Rights. He works across a broad spectrum of practice areas from judicial review, immigration and asylum and inquests, actions against the state authorities, prison law and community care. Stephen acts um, against um, public authorities. He's done um, claims against the police and the Home Office for false imprisonment, human rights breaches, and um, post-inquest civil claims against prison and healthcare authorities. Today, um, Stephen will share his tips uh, and tricks and strategies in terms of maximizing quantum in civil litigation following uh, the inquest. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Stephen. Stephen, over to you. Um, thanks very much for that very kind introduction, Leslie. I, of course, will also be dealing with licks, um, which have been the great mystery of what is a lick in this context. Uh, and although I'm actually told it's uh, good, uh, hitting a lick on a guitar, hitting a lick also means getting a lot of cash very quickly um, and quite useful since I'm going to deal with uh, costs and um, quantum. So uh, just going straight into quantum, first of all, which is the more substantial of the two topics, I'm going to deal with it in, in two parts. I'm going to look at Human Rights Act damages, first of all, um, and particularly going to try and break down how you go about looking at that range of awards you can get for a Article 2 um, breaches in this context, because you have lots of um, bluntly pejorative comments in the um, domestic case law 
about how difficult it is to interpret the Strasbourg case law. And actually, I think that's a little bit unfair. And I'd like to just try, kind of draw out some of the more recent stuff, but particularly how you handle a case where, because of Olcock, because of the control criteria and psychiatric injury, you may struggle to recover um, tortious psych injury damages. But don't let that put you off trying to maximise recovery for psych injury as part of the Human Rights Act claim. And then I'm going to deal with loss of earnings claims as well, um, because that's another area where, in my experience, you will encounter a lot of hostility um, from defendants of the idea you can even get pecuniary loss in these cases. And I'm just going to demonstrate, actually, that's misconceived. Um, if you were able to plead this out properly, um, you actually can get recovery of loss of earnings claims uh, as part of the Article 2 um, Just Satisfaction. So just going on to that first thing and the kind of assessment of damages, this is what you will always see um, from defendants. And sometimes this, uh, and it's always at least at the beginning of their submissions and not uncommonly, it's almost uh, sometimes the only thing that they have to say on damages. And they will come back to, just two kind of crisp paragraphs from Afanyeva and Greenfield, um, right from the beginning of the development on Section 8 um, damages under the Human Rights Act. And you'll always come back to this starting point. And it's true. Under the Strasbourg case law, the idea is to bring an end to the breach. Um, compensation and damages come after that question. Um, but what defendants always allied is that where you can't put someone and bring an end to the breach and you can't put someone back into the position that they would have been if the breach hadn't occurred. And um, that is, of course, the paradigm example of where you go um, and look towards uh, damages awards. And particularly in this case, it doesn't take defendants very far. And um, these cases and those um, extracts are really about whether you award damages or not. Because there is a lot of case law in Article 6, right to fair trial cases where there's been a, a delay to proceedings or um, there hasn't been a fair trial. You see it in um, some parole board cases where there's a delay in bringing matters before the parole board in Article 5 context, where the declaration of a violation is enough because it means that the uh, United Kingdom has to take steps to make sure you get a speedy parole board uh, hearing. That is your remedy. It's only if you have um, something more than that, so the delay is particularly egregious, that then you start getting into the compensation issue, into the compensation issues. Um, and indeed, in this context, you are always going to be looking at awards of damages. Push back when defendants start bringing in Afinyeva and Greenfield and say, well, actually, this doesn't take, no one disputes that. But there is no question that an award of damages is appropriate in, this, in these cases. It's so trite that actually it doesn't assist the judge. Then if you want quite a nice crisp summary um, of the principles to go back to, although it's not, I, it's not perfect, it's uh, right at the end of a typically long, but of course now that he's in the Supreme Court, probably soon to be authoritative, um, although he hasn't yet endorsed his own judgment, uh, Mr. Justice Legger in the Al-Saran and Ministry of Defence cases, that's the what was known as the Iraqi civilian litigation, um, because uh, Leggett deals with some of the high-level principles in uh, 904 to 917. And one of the key things to draw out of those passages is he goes to the practice direction. There is an entire practice direction at Strasbourg, which sets out the principles of just satisfaction. It's not hugely long, it's not very detailed. We'll come on to some of the detail later. Um, but the practice direction is actually massively underused. You will see a lot of criticism. Afanyeva has the pejorative comment about Strasbourg's just satisfaction judgments being impenetrable and difficult to discern. Um, but there is a logic to it. And you can get under, I mean, you can get to understand some of the just satisfaction. Um, judgments by uh, going to the practice direction, actually starting with that as a good framework. Um, now, Laura's already touched on um, this very briefly, um, but we, we, we have the two domestic authorities which people come back to, and, and Mr. Simlet's already raised a useful question in the Q&A about Van Collar. Van Collar was a, was a murder um, where the, uh, the failure to protect Mr. Van Collar from uh, the person who ended up killing him, um, a, an obsessive stalker. Uh, 
And an award was given of £10,000 to the estate and £7,500 to each surviving parent. Now, bear in mind, this is not an authority which is actually, this part of the Court of Appeal judgment was never really, has never really been approved or grappled with particularly uh, well. It's only based on a very short review of four Strasbourg cases, um, one of which is Edwards. Um, and of course, we don't know much about how the quantum case in Van Collar was actually pleaded out. That's something that we'll come back to again in the Strasbourg context. You don't have a huge amount of information on how the judges have actually gone about analysing the level of damages, um, which can sometimes be unhelpful because you just end up getting a, um, a sense that when it says it's an equitable jurisdiction, it's the law, length of the Lord Chancellor's foot uh, type of thing. Um, what's more useful, um, but still has its limitations, is Rabone because that's where you get the 5,000 euro to 60,000 euro band. Um, but even that has to be treated with a degree of care. That, all Lord Dyson really says is that, well, the effect of those cases, which is was set out in Savage Number 2, just hasn't been disputed um, at the Supreme Court level. Um, if you go back to Savage Number 2, actually the passage that Lord Dyson citing is just an observation by the trial judge that Jenny Richards, who was counsel um, for Rabone, uh, sorry, for Savage rather, um, had carried out an exercise of going through all the Strasbourg authorities between 2008 and 2010, saying, well, these are the awards that Strasbourg has given for non-pecuniary loss. It doesn't tell you the useful information, which is, well, what was involved in that non-pecuniary loss? Um, it just gives you a broad range um, and it doesn't actually go too much beyond that. It's useful to, as a sense check, um, as well as operating for inflation, but it's not going to take you too far on assessing where you fall on that spectrum. Comparator cases generally are, they are useful. I, I think it's easy to disparage them, um, but they are actually, you know, useful to have a look at to use as benchmarks um, and to say, well, look, we can kind of see the factors and how much weight they've carried in the assessment. But they do have this limitation. And I, I will admit that Strasbourg, the issue with Strasbourg is not that there isn't a system when it comes um, into play. There is a lot of internal learning at the Strasbourg court about how you go about assessing just satisfaction. Um, it's something that the registry and the judges know and understand by being there and how it gets evaluated. The problem is that that doesn't get transposed into the public facing judgments. So that when you look at the judgment, what you won't be able to see is who actually put in a claim. So not all of these cases appear to have put claims in on behalf of the estate. Um, the question about evidence is actually quite important. We'll come back to it later, but I can say from my own experience when I was at the registry, a lot of just satisfaction claims come in as a bit of a footnote to the rest of the application. If you're ever making a just satisfaction application to Strasbourg, plead it out and build up your evidence base because a lot of these cases end up failing because they are asserted. They're not actually evidenced. Um, Laura touched on it. It's, it, it's recognised in the domestic jurisprudence as well, but do control for um, comparator countries. Uh, I think it was said in, in DSD, um, and in fact, I think it said in Al Saran again, um, Broadly, you want to be looking at countries like France, Germany, with comparable um, costs of living and purchasing power. Uh, those from Eastern European, Turkey, Russia, are going to be less useful. Um, uh, but a useful additional point, again, just to bear in mind when carrying out that exercise, because it can be quite difficult, is that you can look at tortious awards and comparable compensation schemes domestically. It's a take into account jurisdiction. It's going to be relevant. Um, they did that in Z in the United Kingdom. Um, and it's actually emphasized in the practice direction as well. You're not saying, oh, well, I would have got £50,000 under the uh, judicial college guidelines. But you can look at the level of award you're looking to set, um, uh, looking to argue for, and check it against comparable awards for PTSD and psychiatric injury. And particularly where in cases you don't have psychiatric injury, so you're claiming for anxiety and distress. That approach is actually relatively orthodox, not just in the human rights context, but you get exactly the same approach in Data Protection Act claims. So in uh, TLT, 
the group of um, Data Protection Act claims that Mr. Justice Mitting dealt with, he um, awarded a series of um, uh, compensation for anxiety and distress suffered by the asylum seekers whose information had been published on the Home Office website in an unredacted form, and came up with a scale of damages, which broadly reflected awards for low-level psychiatric injury. So this isn't something that is particularly novel. Refer to TLT, point out that the courts are taking this approach of not um, automatically applying them, but benchmarking awards in this field against it. Um, now, since it's been a while since Jenny Richards did her exercise, I've actually done my own exercise um, of looking at, um, uh, I've not quite finished that top tip, but um, looking at some recent damages awards in Article 2 cases. A big one to emphasise in the comparator cases is watch out if it's a substantive or procedural breach of Article 2, because it does make a significant difference as to what level of award you get. You get much higher levels of award in substantive breach cases. Um, it also has consequences for loss of earnings, which I'll come on to later. Um, but just to kind of run through, uh, Laptev and Russia, uh, what we would recognise as being... Um, a relatively straightforward um, case in terms of signs of suicidality. Uh, officers at the police station who didn't treat um, those cries for help and the signs of mental illness appropriately, um, resulting in uh, suicide. Um, now, this also involved a failure, a procedural failure to investigate properly, um, failure to carry out uh, whatever Russia, Russia's equivalent of the um, Middleton in inquest is. Um, but note, um, that they actually didn't put in any positive case as to the level of award. Strasbourg Court expressly records they just left it to the discretion of the court. And actually, £19,000, which is the exchange rate, or the figure I calculated for the exchange rate more accurately, um, is actually quite low in this field. Um, it's again, brings it back to, if you are taking these cases to Strasbourg, I don't know if anyone has aspirations to do so, but you have to be getting your just satisfaction claims properly identified, referenced against the case law and getting your benchmarks in. Now, a really useful case is actually SF in Switzerland because we have expressly on the face of the judgment, a claim for psychiatric injury and an indication of psychiatric injury. Um, and again, there was, this is probably the closest because it's a substantive breach. There's no procedural breach. Um, it's again, a case where there's been insufficient uh, regard to the problems and the indicators of suicide. And the applicant puts in a claim uh, for pecuniary loss, um, for psychotherapy, uh, for the funeral costs. And she also gets an award for non-pecuniary loss of 42,948, which is broadly in keeping with our own judicial college guidelines. Um, for psychiatric injury. Now, we don't know what it was specifically. We don't know what level um, of post-traumatic stress disorder or um, uh, grieving, um, grieving disorder uh, she suffered because we don't get that level of detail. But notice it is significantly higher than some of the other cases we're going to touch on. And that was a sole claim on behalf of SF herself. So just on behalf of her as the mother. Um, now, we come back to Fernandez, um, which is one of the cases that Laura touched on in terms of death in uh, psychiatric detention. Now, again, note, this is a case of a procedural breach. Um, so as Laura said, uh, it was uh, acknowledged by the Strasbourg Court, it's engaged, and you can get an operational duty in this context in principle. Um, but the point that Strasbourg made on finding no substantive breach was just that um, although he'd had suicidal behaviour in the past, his most recent hospitalisation, he wasn't exhibiting suicidality. He was in for alcoholism. Um, his absconsion wasn't picked up on until it was too late. Um, so it was go always going to be fitting into that procedural aspect of Article 2 alone. And you can see there I've itemised actually what they were asking for. Um, and it fails in significant part because it is a procedural duty breach rather than a operational and substantive duty breach. And contrast the sums being claimed there um, for the breach of the substantive duty uh, to the sums that we just saw in SF in Switzerland. Um, she only asked for £10,000 um, on the basis of the, uh, uh, 
breach of the procedural duty and the distress and anxiety attendant to that. Um, so that is the, a good and stark illustration of the difference that a substantive or procedural breach can make at Strasbourg. Um, we can probably deal with these a, a little bit quickly. You can see very bold claim um, by the family um, in Basabillan. Um, 500,000 euros pecuniary loss because of the financial assistance their, the assistance their son would have provided them. Uh, uh, but because it was a procedural duty breach alone, the court found there was no causal link. You can't say it would have made any difference, even to the lower Article 2 causation test that law has dealt with. Um, so it's only a compensation award uh, for the anxiety and distress that their son's investigation wasn't carried out properly. Um, although the second investigation um, was uh, done with commendable efforts, by the stage it concluded it was massively after, uh, you can see the dates in the Strasbourg timeline, um, just from the application number being in 2008 and when Strasbourg dealt with it in 2016. Um, but it took far too long to actually get to the answer. So again, it's a procedural breach. It's not indicative, but notice how high it is, um, even for a procedural breach of £17,000. That is sometimes significantly above some of the awards um, defendants will be talking about for a substantive breach in this jurisdiction. Um, yes, and, and just finally, again, a similar issue um, but this time you have a substantive breach of Article 2. Um, again, facts which are very similar to anyone who deals with um, failures in the act process in um, Her Majesty's prisons. Um, but the failure here is, again, it is one of the points I drew out earlier. The claim for pecuniary loss didn't fail because there was no causal link or it was, it, it was not recoverable in principle. It failed because they hadn't come up with any documentary evidence. It was not properly pleaded out. Um, but even um, bearing that in mind, of course, when you turn to the non-pecuniary damage, you have an award of 43,473. So quite substantial and significant awards. Bear in mind, it's uh, got the procedural element in there as well as the substantive element. Um, but again, quite significantly high. Um, and just, I think that's a useful point to pick up on that issue of non-pecuniary damage. Uh, it, it ranges from everything that we would include as psychiatric injury to these various different formulations. Strasbourg has a, a couple of stock phrases it always likes to use in its judgments. Uh, you do see sometimes the same phraseology coming up again and again, uh, and it can be quite entertaining to try and trace back where actually Richard came from, but it's awards for physical and mental suffering which involves uncertainty and anxiety, frustration and helplessness, distress and anxiety. Lord Bingham in Greenfield at 16 deals with all the different taxonomy of, that this has been expressed in. Indeed, I've given you the little extract from uh, Laptev in Russia um, about the anguish and distress. So it's a very broad range of different factual scenarios. So when you're looking at those comparator cases, um, bear in mind, you're looking at that breadth of cases. And some of those cases will be at the level where there is no psychiatric injury. The point I just made about the Data Protection Act claims. Um, and you can do, as I say, bring in those judicial college guidelines. So if you have a, a bereaved um, mother, son, um, brother who has acquired psychiatric injury, um, you don't think you're going to be able to get home on negligence because of the issues about the Olcott control criteria don't think that that means you're going to suffer a significant cut to the judicial college guideline figures when claiming and arguing for your quantum in uh, uh, in the Just Satisfaction Human Rights Act damages cases. As I say, look at SF in Switzerland, um, provided you can read French. Uh, it's not out of line with our own judicial college guidelines. You can look at the judicial college guidelines as Z in the United Kingdom uh, and the practice direction indicate. And actually, again, if you look at DSD, which is an Article 3 investigative duty breach, um, sometimes, and I have had defendants say, well, actually, if you look at um, DSD, despite the very severe PTSD she had, she only recovered, uh, I think it was 29,250. Um, you may have got my sums wrong. Lawyers, not good at maths. But... Uh, uh, and, and well, and that's indicative of the um, reduction you have from the Judicial College guidelines in Human Rights Act claims. That's not right. If you read the quantum judgment in DSD, part of the reason that um, 
Mr. Justice Green awards less figures in respect of the uh, commissioner's liability is because she, uh, DSD had already acquired compensation from War Boys's um, estate through, I think it was the sale of his property to the sum of £10,000 each. She'd made a seeker claim against um, uh, in respect of her injuries and was awarded £13,500. Um, and when you then add into the fact that this is not a substantive breach, she, she's not pleading out uh, an operational breach uh, and she's not saying that the state directly inflicted Article 3 treatment on her. Um, that is actually quite a generous level of award. The le levels of award in these cases do not have to be as low as defendants would have you believe. There is a lot of authority provided you can go through, um, or indeed ask for the PowerPoint after this. Um, if you pick it all out and put it together, you can actually argue for significantly higher levels of recovery um, than uh, it might appear. And in a psychiatric injury claim, you can and should be looking at actually quite significant levels of recovery um, in lines with the Judicial College guidelines. If you have a good psychiatric report um, secured early, and actually, if I'm going back to my top tips, um, bear in mind that your psychiatric injury is always going to be worse before the inquest. We all know as practitioners how much it winds up and increases um, someone's distress and as a stressor and an aggravator and sometimes a trigger um, for a psychiatric crisis. If you get psychiatric reports before the inquest and establish it, you are going to be able to serve them on the defendant and say, well, look, this is very serious. Post inquest, now, some families do, all families behave uniquely, um, but that stressor is now going to be removed. You're going to be in a stronger position pre-inquest than you are going to be post-inquest. It's uncertain that if you can get out there early, you can exert pressure on the defendants um, at an early stage, provided you're getting your material in line um, before the inquest. Um, so just turning away um, from the kind of non-pecuniary loss and just satisfaction, um, I'm just going to deal with loss of earnings. Um, now, I, I have said here, you know, you've got your two different reach. You've got your secondary victim status and negligence and just satisfaction. Just to give you a kind of very brief overview of where we are with secondary victim status. Have things improved since um, the House of Lords in the 90s decided to ruin this entire field trying to deal with post Hillsborough civil claims? The answer is no. Uh, the uh, Alcock uh, control criteria are alive and well. Um, and, you know, next time I hear an English judge complaining about Strasbourg's case law being difficult to interpret, I'll just remind them what a pig's ear they managed to make of this field of law um, and how unsatisfactory it is to have um, high, uh, House of Lords judges saying, nah, we'll leave it for Parliament to sort out. Um, but you have there just the brief summary from Liverpool Women's Hospital, uh, the kind of four, a very brief summary of the, very, of the, the criteria. And it's that second criteria. Um, uh, second and third criteria we are always going to struggle with in most of our cases. Um, when you're talking about psychiatric detention, prison deaths, even if you're getting that telephone call um, at 2 a.m., as one of my recent clients did, um, or you're getting it the next day, you are going to fail because of, and you've got the reference to Taylor there, being um, even told where you were at the hospital, um, getting that phone call, it's not the immediate aftermath. Uh, you are not, as in the successful claims in the Hillsborough litigation, the original Hillsborough litigation, I should say, um, walk it shortly, walking shortly after um, the aftermath of the event was over. Um, it's grossly unsatisfactory as a principle, uh, as a principle that that is where we've been left um, by the uh, House of Laws Authority. It is worth saying, for those of you who are interested, um, there is a bit of movement on this front. Uh, two cases in the clinical neg negligence area are going to the Court of Appeal um, uh, from both the Master's Corridor and from a judgment of Mr Justice Chamberlain. Um, it's not inconceivable we may say see some further movement. Lord Reed in the Supreme Court, as we've seen from, uh, well, to what extent Robinson was a departure from Hill or just its death knell, to a particular interpretation of it. But Lord Reed, there has been a lot of tortious case law and a lot of restatement of the principles. We've just had a restatement of recovery of pure economic loss in the um, 
uh, and, and how to interpret SAMCO. So the Supreme Court is active in this area. I don't recommend plunging into this because we can actually have success through the just satisfaction route. Um, as I say, nothing in Affenreva or Greenfield means that you can't recover um, pecuniary loss and loss of earnings. Um, if you are into the field of awarding for psychiatric injury in this field um, and demonstrating that direct causal link, that's the phrase you will always get from Strasbourg in respect of uh, uh, economic, not pure economic loss, loss of earnings claims, um, you can recover this. Um, Greenfield, if you read beyond those initial paragraphs that the defendants like to quote, it deals with this positively and says this is recoverable in principle. Um, uh, if you look at the UCOS judgment, um, and you can see I've just given you the um, sort of three cases that kind of deal with this over time, um, the principle of putting you back into the position you would have been if you hadn't suffered the breach of the convention is a good one. Um, it's that direct causal link element that most claims flounder on. But it's worth it emphasizing in UCOS, uh, an Article 1, Protocol 1 claim, I think combined with Article 6, they got the full value of the confiscated company. Run it. It's the largest award that Strasbourg has ever given, running into the billions. Um, just because it's human rights doesn't mean that those principles about um, recovery are displaced um, and don't allow defendants to suggest otherwise. Um, a really good, useful and a rare judgment from Strasbourg that just deals with just satisfaction is actually Smith and Grady. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with it because it was the famous case, uh, I think, in fact, with... Uh, Garden Court Council representing uh, Mr. Smith and Mr. Grady, I think, um, uh, dealing with the dismissal of LGBT, LGBT plus soldiers in the early 90s um, from the armed services just because they were LGBT. Um, they made um, significant claims of a loss of earnings claim, both, both based on their past loss in terms of their, serv um, their salary, um, the future losses and the difference between the income they would have earned if they were in the services and their promotions and all their future prospects and even the loss of pension rights. And you can see there they did put in a very significant uh, claim um, for those um, three different limbs. Now, again, health warning applies here. I am not clear if they put in um, the expert evidence of an employment expert, um, which is what you will always need in loss of earnings claims in order to get home. It's a complex area. No one loves going through uh, the Ogden tables. Um, I certainly don't. Uh, maybe some of you do. Um, I shouldn't prejudge. But um, Strasbourg goes through and says, well, it starts to come out with some cautious. Um, and I think that would be one thing I would draw out when you're looking at Smith and Grady and looking at the way Strasbourg does it. You can get future loss of earnings claims, um, but Strasbourg is quite cautious about them. You're going to need your evidence about future losses. And you can see here, when Strasbourg's dealing with it, it comes in and points out, well, it's because of the uncertain nature and the pro prophylactic uh, predictions about you would have got this promotion and you would have got this, um, uh, you would have been promoted to sergeant, to colour sergeant, uh, regimental sergeant major um, in the armed forces it's going to become more and more uncertain and you get further away from that direct causal link. Uh, that is the question that Strasbourg keeps coming back to. And so uh, you end up with this very broad summary at the end of um, the section of Smith and Grady on the principles saying, well, you know, let's have a look at it in the round with regard to what is <laughs> equitable and within discretion. Um, and it goes back when dealing with the first applicant, who's just the one that I've taken because uh, I didn't want to have to calculate inflation and exchange rates twice. Um, it's a, it goes back and it says, well, what was the underlying factual basis? What findings did we make in the substantive judgment in terms of the severity of the breach? Um, what was the impact on the applicant and what evidence are we, do we have about that? Um, and what have they done since? And uh, it came up with the following conclusion. So for the past loss of earnings, £30,000, that's from 1994 to 2000. Um, I, the figures in brackets are those with inflation against the £64,000 claimed. And it's with the future loss of earnings and pension rights, you can start to see the way in which Strasbourg isn't going as far as Smith and Grady, uh, Smith wanted them to go. An award of £15,000 
and £14,000 for the last two headings for an overall award, bearing in mind this is Article 8, um, of £59,000. So you can get these awards in principle. Now, I've given you the health warning. I don't know if they had an employment expert or if they just put in uh, the generic information. If you are making a loss of earnings claim and you want to hit the defendant hard, get an employment expert once you identify this being an issue. That obviously brings up a certain amount of pressure. We're all working, trying to focus on the inquest. And I've already said, oh, you should start getting psychiatric reports. You can't start the work of your employment expert. And indeed, your family may may not be in a position to start handing over large rooms of financial information um, to the employment expert who then has the psychiatric report. But just start thinking about. And if you just want to do it in principle, because your family member may not want uh, the extravagant and lavish sums that Smith and Grady were after, um, it's, it's a conversation to have with your client about how far do you want to push this right now? Um, but as I say, in principle, you can get um, pecuniary loss. And that's kind of what I wanted to come back to is there is nothing special about these types of claims. I have made them and defendants have settled them, um, both in the post inquest uh, civil claim field and I- even in some um, judicial reviews against the Metropolitan Police. Um, you, you can actually do this. Um, just reminding you of that point, because I dealt with it in the non-pecuniary loss case, it has to be a Article 2 substantive breach. So we're talking about operational duty breach, systemic duty breach, not an investigative duty breach or procedural uh, duty breach, um, because that um, is just going to be really looking at non-pecuniary loss. You're not going to have your direct causal link between the loss of earnings, the financial losses, um, if you are just in the field of uh, procedural duty breach. Uh, There we go, costs. With my usual disclaimer, um, I am good for more than just costs and procedure. I was once defamed by Silka and other chambers who suggested I had a subscription to the Cost Lawyer Review. I do not, please do not repeat that. Um, But just to help you in terms of maximizing your recovery on IP rates, um, it's a sad fact that that is a a part of the economic model that has been forced on us by LASPO and even to a certain extent, the Access to Justice Act 1999. So it is important to be thinking in these terms. Um, You'll all be very familiar, I'm sure, with um, Fulick, which kind of grasped with this area and actually kept brought up to date since the previous case of Roach. Um, And you have the two stages. And it's that first stage that defendants will be starting to try and knock you out on um, before you even get to the um, question of recovery is, did the, um, does your bill include items or was it necessary to attend um, the inquest for the purposes of the civil claim. So we all know you can't recover for jury waiting time. You can't recover for making submissions to the coroner on uh, uh, what conclusions are open to him, but you can do for witnesses and witness prep. Um, and secondly, you will look at proportionality. Fulick is good on proportionality, good in definitely with a small G rather than capital G. Um, because you are having that statement, you've got that statement, this is not just about money or compensation. It's not about, well, the claim is for 50,000 or you settle for 50,000 pounds and uh, your costs are 100,000 pounds. That's disproportionate, slash down. Breaches of Article 2, non-monetary relief, um, lessons being learned. There are elements to Article 2 civil claims that justify a higher level of um, cost recovery. One thing to say, of course, is the vulnerability of our clients of course. And that is a perfectly legitimate factor to put into the proportionality exercise and the amount of time and care and skill it takes to um, assist family members who are going through a difficult grieving process and an extension to the grieving process and the inquest. Um, At the same time that you're trying to talk to them about settling for what seems like paltry sums of the loss of life of their loved one. So one of the things that I've I've had recently, um, mostly in uh, psychiatric deaths in custody, in the pri- usually involving the private sector and outsourced um, NHS mental health care, is that you get a series of admissions. And they might even start hinting at the fact they're going to make admissions um, at a pre- pre-inquest review. What, what can you actually do in order to deal with those? And how do you um, prevent them from the defendant starting to put pressure on you and saying, well, actually, you can't get any of the costs back um, or the cost of attending the inquest um, as part of the civil claim on IP rates? Um, Well, 
if they're trying to push you into the zone of there being a blanket rule or a bright line about recovery, that is wrong. Um, And actually, my experience is defendants don't usually deal with this particularly well. Um, They are trying to um, push you away and intimidate you, but, you know, they're trying to exert as much pressure as they can. And there's a couple of robust things you can do to push against them. First off is just timing. The time for... um, the time at which you need to start considering this issue is not when counsel for um, the healthcare provider says in a pre-inquest review hearing, we are going to make admissions to this effect. Say that the time that you start considering this point is when you actually receive those admissions as part of the inquest process. But even then, don't allow the, defend- uh, don't allow the defendant to push back too hard. There is a process very well established for actually making formal ambitions of fact. My last inquest, we got a note, um, which was just one side of A4 with a series of bullet points. Um, and we're having pushback uh, with the accompanying letter in the civil claim saying, please see admissions in the inquest. There is a formal process in CPR 14 um, for making pre-issue missions. They should be following that. If they haven't followed it, it's not a silver bullet for you, and therefore you get to recover everything and you can go home. But already you're going to push back on the defendant and start making them look bad because they've not got their act together properly um, and made those admissions formally. And usually without the rigour and identification of points that they would do in a civil claim. And that's actually useful because a lot of the time where I've had admissions, um, and if you've had different experience, you know, please do pipe up, um, it's not gonna cover all of the breadth of issues. We all know that as we get to the inquest process, there are going to be new issues that only come out from the witnesses that you attend, uh, that you um, are asking questions of and exploring the evidence. It's still an inquisitorial process where this is part of the investigation. It's not concluded at the point that the defendant makes those admissions. Um, May just be very, uh, it's a very useful thing and it makes your, bill of costs much more tight in justifying this. If you make sure as you go along, identifying out which witnesses you've identified at the hearing who have brought out new facts and issues which go beyond those admissions. Um, Because, and it's that last point that I've just put on the PowerPoint slide, you're not just there for whether there was a breach or not, or whether it was causative um, in the uh, Article 2 inquest sense you're also perfectly entitled to be there and be asking questions because you need to identify how egregious the breach is for the level of Article 2 damages you can recover, and, and as Lord Dyson set out in Rabone. So often, yes, the defendant may have pleaded a, a quite nice, uh, perhaps even comprehensive, new, neutrally drafted statement, but the true egregiousness of the breach is only brought home when you're at the inquest. So just start thinking um, of where that is taking you and if you've got prospects there to be able to justify recovery. Um, Mercifully, that is the end of my presentation. So we have um, some time for questions. Thank you, Stephen. Um, We do have time for questions. Um, And I'm just, if, if anybody wants to ask any questions, please, feel free to put your questions in the chat. Um, Here's a question for um, both of you. Uh, In an inquest uh, where you've successfully argued that Article 2 is engaged because of systemic failings, are there any extra things to be aware of at the civil claim stage? So it's quite a broad question. Um, Who'd like to have a go at just having a answering that i mean i'm i'm happy to come in first laura yeah sure. you can go first yeah um i i think the one thing to be aware of is that i think and it's perhaps even a useful thing about what actually we mean by a systemic um breach is that that duty in the stars in in the article 2 taxonomy is the framework obligation it's about having that series of rules policies procedures um in place um And that sometimes, I think, gets mixed up with what are actually operational duty breaches um, uh, because you actually have a a situation where because they don't have policies in place, because they are not capturing that information correctly, they don't carry out a proper risk assessment of suicide, for example. 
Um, that actually properly pleaded out as an operational duty breach. Um, and I say that's that's significant because it goes back to some of the points I've touched on um, for your quantum, your measure of damages. Um, the systemic duty is at a higher level um, than the operational duty. So when it comes to arguing for the level of just satisfaction damages, you're going to be further removed. Um, and it might just be useful where you are dealing with a systemic breach case, make sure you connect it to an operational breach. And it's, it's, it's relatively simple. It's just the statement that I've already gone through. Because you don't have a proper um, equivalent to the ACT process, you don't have a proper monitoring process, you don't have policies or training, you know, the high level stuff, um, uh, that um, has led to a situation which you do not know where you ought to have known if you've been doing things properly, a real risk to life. Um, and I think that's probably just, it's a question of framing rather than anything yeah. else. Thank you. Um, is there anything you would like to add, Laura, to that question? No, just, just on what Stephen uh, touched on, and the need to be cautious about whether you're, you're dressing up an operational failing as a, as a mere systemic one. Uh, and as much as you can, uh, try and find the evidence basis to, to argue both. Um, it, it will maximise your, your prospects of success. And what I touched on earlier about uh, the line of case law, Powell in UK and also Lupa de Caesar, they, they deal with it in different ways. Uh, but Powell is about systemic failings in the context of, of the hospital care. And Lupa de Caesar, when that can in itself be an operational breach if it results in the denial of uh, life-saving treatment. So, so you've got to consider the context in which you're, in which you're pleading these and, and try and maximise all cause of action on all bases rather than just sticking with your systemic breach, which, as Stephen said, you may well not recoup the damages you're looking for sufficiently. Okay, thank you. A couple more questions. Um, here's a question for you. Can you confirm that Quox protection does not apply to an HRA claim? <laughs> I think that's probably Stephen's. Yeah, I thought, I thought that might be the case. Uh, I think the answer is uh, yes for the time being. Um, it still it doesn't fit within the definition of personal injury claims for the purposes of CPR 44.16, if I've got my CPR number incorrect. Um, so for the time being, it won't. If you have a mixed claim, uh, the answer is if, after that series of cases we've, we've had over the last couple of years, like Brown, um, which still um, bugs me. Um, if you have a mixed claim, it, you're in the hands of the discretion of the judge. So where it overlaps with um, uh, the personal injury claim and the tortious cause of action, uh, you can persuade. And I have persuaded some judges that actually, although it's a mixed claim, you shouldn't lift Cox protection at all. You should keep it in place. It's just you're into that realm of discretion. So if you appear at Central, uh, uh, Central London County Courts in front of those well-known judges who are familiar to um, any police action lawyers down south, um, you're not getting anywhere with uh, particularly generous um, Cox arguments. Their discretion will always be exercised on a pretty mechanistic basis. Um, but uh, you know, don't don't allow it to be put off. If you can, if you do have a good mixed civil claim, um, do. Um, you know, see where you can get with Cox not being disapplied. I think the case law has given a bit of a negative spin on how much you can actually push back on that, just because of particularly Brown, which was truly, you know, that, that was an egregious um, example of someone tacking a personal injury claim onto what was in truth a data protection act claim. Sure. Um, All uh, right. Let's move on because we've, um, we've got um, uh, a few minutes left. There's a, another question here. Have you got any tips on dealing with the statutory charge in civil claims following an inquest? Uh, well, just, I mean, my experience of that is, again, you need to be really discriminating and cautious when it comes to obviously a, a accruing cost that you may not recover later down the line, in particular with relation to expert evidence. So looking at the evidence that you've already adduced through through the inquest, the extent that you, extent that you can rely on that, and whether you do really need further expert evidence in the event that it may well not be helpful, and you may not be able to recoup the damages from that from the defendant, even if you're successful on another part of the claim. So it's, so it's again, just really scrutinising uh, the cost and the necessity for any further evidence above and beyond what you may already have at that early settlement stage post post inquest. Okay. Um, 
I, I've got I've got a question. This is the uh, chair's prerogative, um, and I'm sure most people who deal with inquests and civil claims will at some point have this situation. Uh, how do you, you know, what tips or strategies do you advise using where you've had an inquest and you've had a really poor result, but you've got the civil action. Um, so, you know, poor result, um, in, in terms of not what you were expecting um, and, uh, you know, the, the defendants are saying, uh, yeah, boo sucks, you, you know, had a poor result at the inquest. Um, ha what do you do in terms of if you still want to push ahead? What, what, what strategies do you have? Shall I, shall I go first, Laura? I think we're both um, hesitating to he see who went first. Um, I, I, so far, I, what I've largely done is when you are, because in those cases, you will probably have to issue particulars. Um, and what I've generally done is, um, whether it's jury or non-jury, I mean, a lot of times you will get knocked out on the coroner's assessment of um, the Galbraith Plus test. Um, and, and that's often the biggest issue. Um, you can obviously get sometimes uh, somewhat cryptic and garbled jury uh, uh, findings as well. Um, that, of course, is not, it's sometimes not even necessarily um, admissible um, in terms of the subsequent civil claim, certainly not binding, um, as in fact defendants are often want to do in terms of that causation question. Uh, and actually, I wouldn't necessarily be particularly put out. I think what you go back to, particularly if it's a causation issue in a suicide case, is build up that timeline and build up that picture. You know, often when it comes to survivability, for example, or um, windows of opportunity, you will have that generic statement that, well, brain death follows in about five minutes from suspension of the ligature. There are some experts who actually say it's a much broader window than that. And the window of survivability is actually much more significant, depending on the facts of the case. Um, I wouldn't, what I would just do is I would, I would get, go back to your notes of evidence and go back to your disclosure and build up that timeline and actually pick out all of the things, now you're in an adversarial context, that demonstrates the defendant, you don't actually have a clear run at this at all. Um, there is a lot here that you're at risk of. You know, don't allow it to put you off not making a civil claim unless you are satisfied in your own mind. Actually, you know what? That's a fair finding on the evidence. And I think that yeah. probably reflects where you would get to in the civil claim. Yeah. Thank you. Um, did you did you have any views on that, Laura? Just just on the la Stephen's last point, when, when I've um, uh, been faced with that scenario, I, I try as much as I can to exploit uh, the unfavourable or adverse evidence that's come out in, in the inquest. And like Stephen said, both through disclosure and through your live evidence, um, at the pre-action stage, this wouldn't be arguably an attractive claim for the other side to litigate, even if you didn't get that favourable outcome or, or findings at the end of the line. And also obviously to underline that it's a different form and uh, it's not determinative, and, and this is still in the defender's interest to settle so as much as you can just try and capitalize on any of the adverse evidence you had even if you didn't get the critical jury finding all the coroner sitting alone that, that you expected or wanted okay thank you laura there's i think we've got time for one more question before our time runs out um let me read this so my question is about the statutory charge again now how this applies to civil claims after an inquest I have a claim that's due to settle imminently after the inquest concluded, but prior to the issue of civil proceedings. So I act on legal help only, no certificate. My understanding is that in these circumstances, the statute charge applies only the cost on the inquest um, certificate and not to the uh, inquest legal help or the civil claim legal help. The difficulty is, is that the exceptional um, case funding certificate is where most of council's costs are. Are there any particular pointers, um, issues to be aware of re-cost recovery? 
Um, Laura, do you want to? Yeah, I was going to say, I'm, I'm not sure I can really particularly assist with this. It's a very interesting nuanced question. Uh, it's not one I've come across myself yet, unless, unless Stephen can help. Well, I was, I, I've, I was asked this question in my last inquest about, you know, what's going to happen with the statutory charge and, and how does it deal with? I think the, the answer is if, if you have a legal aid um, certificate in the civil claim, it becomes a bit easier. Um, but if you actually go back to the language of the stat- statutory charge and where it where it bites, um, it's on. Uh, let me just get up the exact language of uh, section twenty five. Yeah, so it bites on um, property that is recovered in connection with which the services were provided, um, and the cost payable to the claimant by another person in connection with such proceedings. Now, when you're acting on your ECF certificate, you are not uh, acting in such in connection with the civil claim. Now, your council will, of course, have a kind of dual function. There will be stuff that you will want to bill on the ECF file, and there will be stuff that they will want to bill on the civil file. Um, But anything you bill on the civil file, um, if you don't recover it, sorry, yeah, so anything that's on the ECF file, it shouldn't bite for the purposes of the statutory charge. Um, if, you, if you've divided it up in that way and your council's given you a, a, a note that divides it up into ECF work and civil claim work, which it sounds like you're in the position of doing. Um, if you don't, it's the cost that you don't recover in respect to the legal aid civil claim certificate um, in respect to the civil claim. The ECF stuff that you've done for the inquest that is not in connection with the civil claim. You're doing it for the purposes of attending the inquest and to discharge the state's Article 2 duty to provide effective representation and participation for families. That's the way I've squared it. I think you, you, it's a little unsatisfactory and it kind of seems um, a little bit like you're putting the procedure for billing as to the substantive answer, but that's the closest I've been able to get to in terms of an outcome. Um, I don't think, for example, if you don't recover the costs of appearing in front of the coroner and arguing for a conclusion or jury sitting in terms of your daily refreshes, that's the statutory charge bites on those yeah. um, those items. I don't think it does. Um, that's really helpful. Thank you. Well, look, uh, everyone, we're, we're out of time, but I want to, you know, give a big round of applause to our speakers, Laura and Stephen. Thank you so much. That's been really informative. And can I thank all of our attendees for making time to come to this really informative um, seminar? Thank you.